Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Philippe Cabreo. Dr. Cabreo is the principal investigator at the Cabreo Lab, a professor at the University of Cologne in Germany, and is an associate professor at Imperial College London. Dr. Cabreo has his PhD in biochemistry, and his main research interests include the molecular mechanisms underlying metabolic disease, cancer, and aging. The Cabreo Lab closely studies the gut microbiome, including the effects of diet, lifestyle, and metformin on microbial health. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, my pleasure. So it's a pleasure having you with us, Philippe. And I would like to start by the beginning and learn about your background. Uh, how have you decided to uh, become a scientist and how have you decided to yeah, study it's aging? A good, uh, it's a good question. Not one that I usually ask myself very often, but it's just happening <laughs> kind of naturally, right? I think from a very early age, I was always very curious about the world. So I used to spend my, my, my days, it's funny, you have, you have the thing about the public library just behind you. And I used to spend my days as a young kid going to libraries to read books about rocks and and animals, etc. And I think it just kept going as I as I grew older. And I I had a very good teacher in, in, in high school who really got me into into biology. So so it just went on. And then the aging aspect of the research, though, that was a, a bit of that was random. Sometimes things are random, right? So I I got into an Erasmus degree experience outside Portugal. So I did my university in Portugal, and then went to France to do a year of Erasmus. And we had to choose between three projects and we couldn't make our minds. So we literally picked randomly. And we ended up in a lab that was studying already kind of some aspects of aging or the redox biology. And then it just took from that basically. I stayed, then I went to the UK to work with David James on a similar topic. And then uh, again, a random finding almost to, took me into the microbiome and aging. Excellent. So. My next question is about uh, microbiome. So before we uh, uh, dive into your uh, research, we'd like to have some uh, background for our audience about uh, microbiome. What is the micro microbiome and, uh, and uh, how can it uh, change or evolve during the life of the uh, human So the being? microbiome is, is a field that has literally exploded in the past 20 years. There was a lot of interest already before that, but it kind of died off because people realized of the complexity of the microbiome. And indeed, we didn't just didn't have the tools to study it properly. But with the development of the genomics and the costs also going down, this really allowed to start studying in very fine detail what kind of microbes we carry. And we realized that actually we carry an enormous variety of microbes and they on their own or in communities can produce molecules that can influence many, many aspects of our physiology. And that includes our behavior, uh, our ability to obtain nutrients, and also the production of vitamins, but also our communication with the immune system. It trains our immune system to be more aware of other pathogens and so on. So it's really a, an ecosystem living within us that dictates our physiology. And this concept that human cells are, you know, central to everything. And we often do that because we like to put ourselves at the center of everything as humans, but we kind of realize actually more and more that where this complex ecosystem of human cells and bacterial cells, and one depends on the other, and it's a constant communication that goes on that determines our well-being ultimately. Yeah, that's uh, it's very interesting. And maybe, as you said, we are a self-centered. So it's uh, sad for us to know that we might have more, uh, uh, bacteria in our body than uh, cells of ourselves, but that's that's the reality. And we are scientists, and we need to 
accepted. So if we are uh, uh, talking about aging and longevity, uh, your work started to show some uh, relationship between uh, gut microbiome and aging. Uh, I've heard and seen some uh, discussion about microbiome clock. So basically like the Hovas clock, yeah. now we have uh, a, a microbiome clock. Is it a, a causation in your opinion or correlated? Uh, I would love to so yeah, about it's, that. so indeed the microbiome clock is an interesting one. Now several labs have, have, have designed different clocks based on different parameters. Whether it's causative or correlational, this it's yes for both in a way. So it definitely maps very clearly our aging process. We can obtain, we can predict human aging within five to six years of error, which is fairly okay. Whether it's causative or has a role, well, then that's where our science does uh, have an, an important contribution. We can show very clearly that by changing the, the composition of, of different microbes or even within a microbe to produce X, Y, or Z molecule, we can very strongly influence the aging process. So in a way, it's both. It really is. You can predict human aging based on what is there because it, it maps the constant changes in the communities, map the aging process itself, but it gives us also the opportunity for intervention by regulating them and allowing them to produce the molecules that are necessary to age, to age more gracefully, if you want to put it this way. So, so a follow-up question about that is, do you think that the uh microbiome can be an intervention that will allow us to expand lifespan. I, I believe so. I think we're in the, in the early days of that. We're still trying to figure out what is this community really doing? And what are these molecules that we can uh, explore in a way to enhance? But even just this week, there was a paper came out in, in, in Cell where you could, they, they basically created a, a modified microbe that could engraft very easily in humans. And then they could by doing that, we basically have now a delivery system that will allow us to produce certain molecules uh, that could be constantly given to a patient and to sustain rather than constantly taking something. That's one way of achieving that. Uh, the, but there's also another possibility for intervention. If we detect uh, or identify bugs that could have a detrimental role in aging, then we could have therapies that are very specifically targeted to eliminate potentially those microbes and therefore in a, it, uh, age gracefully. And a third alternative could be if we know that a microbe has actually already naturally producing something positive, then we could potentially have a therapy that could enhance its abundance basically. And that could be a dietary or it could be pharmacological in a way that could really enhance and increase the abundance of this microbe and therefore push towards that positive effect. And do we know much about how nutrition can influence the microbiome? So there's, Certainly there's lots of companies. That absolutely. That, so there's a lot going on on that. It's a field that has just exploded. I think the person who's done the biggest contribution to this is probably the Jeffrey Gordon lab in, in the US. And, and indeed, now people are actually starting to create foods with specific fibers that really can be utilized by only very a small subset of microbes that can feed on those substrates and then increase their abundance. So there's really a push towards that. No one has actually combined that approach with enhancing or increasing the number of bugs that could be uh, positive for aging, but the, the, it's literally adding one plus one almost. Uh, the, the only problem is we haven't yet fully characterized or identified, although there's some research suggesting that a book called like Hermantium musifinella could potentially do that role. So the research is still lacking a little bit on identifying and knowing which microbes to, to target and to, but then once that part is figured out properly, then the rest will just fall into place quite neatly. And uh, Philippe, a follow up uh, on uh, that point is, have you or anyone else show that a diet can uh, modulate the uh, aging or longevity in any model organism? And if yes, can yes, you Yes, we did actually. In 2019, so we did work where we developed this high throughput system or screening method where we could challenge microbes with 400 different nutrients. So we really went to the molecular level of nutrition and try to understand which nutrients could alter metabolism in the context of a, a compound that is naturally 
given to people with type 2 diabetes, but it's, there's a lot of research suggesting that it could be also a pro-longevity and health span drug, which is called metformin. So we could show that indeed these two drugs, could, the drug and the nutrition could influence and play together almost. And the microbes had the ability to understand that the two triggers at the same time and integrate different responses depending on those on the individual composition of each nutrient. So we could map very neatly exactly what nutrients were doing what and which pathways were being activated in the micro and the consequence of that activation, which would lead to the production of molecules that could have a longevity effect. And specifically fiber, you mentioned before, I feel as if, you know, when we usually talk about fiber in the microbiome, we just talk about it as a general food supply that could help to increase the population. But now shifting that to also thinking about specific outputs that microbiome would be able to produce now. Are there other specific types of fibers or other nutrients similar to fiber that I guess can not only increase a population, I should say, is that even true? Um, but then also, you know, impact those outputs of bacteria as well. So this is an interesting question because I think we, the field is really moving to this molecular nutrition to really tease apart what could you use instead of, because fiber indeed is very general in a way, right? And often you increase sure, certain populations, but it's very nonspecific. And the output of that, as you said, and well, is the production of those often short chain fatty acids, which again, there's a loose, lot of literature suggesting very positive effects on all kinds of things. But the, if it was such an amazing thing, well, how come we're not all taking charge of fatty acids constantly in a way, right? So there's still, there's a disconnection between the literature and the real world in a way where we know that there are limitations to those studies, there are limitations to those findings. Therefore, we're not there yet. So going more into this, Molecular nutrition will allow us to have a more specific approach towards the enrichment of microbe A, B, or C, but this is still in current. It's still under exploration. That's very interesting. Are there nutrients on the opposite of that, that we know negatively impact the microbiome as a whole or produce those, you know, byproducts yeah. that are not beneficial for so that's, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, the, well, the high fat sugar diets are known to be detrimental in many, many ways, but there's a lot of very good research showing that a lot of the negative consequences of the high fat and high sugar diets are through a creation of what we call a dysbiotic microbiome, which is ultimately an imbalance of kind of a steady state of microbiome that is homeostatic. So we're shifting that equilibrium by having those high sugar, high fat, which of course then leads to the production of, often people talk about lipopolysaccharides because there's an enrichment in certain types of bacteria that produce those molecules, which can cause inflammation. And of course, inflammation is one of the drivers or known drivers of aging. So there's definitely a, an understanding of the, of what is negative and, but how then to counterbalance that is, is complicated because although the microbiome rebounds quite quickly, depending on what you do and what you eat and what kind of drugs you take, it's still a multifactorial situation that needs to be studied very carefully and in, in combination. And I think this is the big challenge because often we tend to study one element at a time. But the problem is real life isn't like that, right? So, and it's usually this multifactorial interventions ultimately that we should be studying because they do play on each other. And that's where I think the current limitation is actually that, is understanding all these different things working at the same time. That's also, an important thing that we should... other researchers too, is, you know, a lot of these longevity interventions work great when it's a mouse in a lab, you control everything they eat, you force them to exercise, but in humans that actually exist in the world, it's a lot harder to yeah. see. Yeah. So, so, so a follow-up uh, question to that is, is there a variability or a, a, a big difference uh, between human based on gender, age, weight? You, you alluded about disease, so I assume that when a, 
for example, when you consume uh, antibiotic, uh, absolutely some of the bacteria will disappear. But can you a bit elaborate about the difference in the subpopulation based on those criteria? So in terms of genetics, there's some interesting research going on about that. There's a lot of dispute about how much host genetics can impact on the microbiome. And some work on twins does seem to show that there's some sort of heritability within the microbiome, but it's not as convincing as the role of environmental factors. So that's the most consensual kind of understanding is that actually it's pretty much the interaction between the microbes and what we eat, what we take, that really dominates in explaining the differences that we have between, between individuals. But if, again, there's some studies, if you do look at for example, different populations from different parts of the world, sure, you can make differences, but those are often as a result of the diets and the traditions and, and the things that are done locally rather than rather than, than the genetics at play. So, so uh, if we are thinking about that, so you're saying genetics, and we have the similar observation from Iran Sigal that say that uh, uh, genetic is not a big player. Uh, and we are really uh, interested and excited about uh, uh, nutrition and diet. So any uh, uh, tips maybe that you can give to our listener about uh, how can they uh, tailor their diet to make their microbiome happier and better? So I think that it's just to eat as varied as possible, right? Uh, a lot of one thing that from the literature that seems to be, again, quite consensual is that diversity is a good thing. So, so the more rich your microbiome is in terms of diversity, the more resilient it is and the more capable it is of withstanding, and withstanding invasion from infections, et cetera, et cetera, but also in the ability of communicate with the other microbes in the, the community to produce molecules of interest, right? Because they don't always, they, they work like little chains, little factories that constantly, one produces some things and to another one and, you know, and we're at the receiving end of that communication where we'll get some of those molecules. So as rich as possible in terms of diversity of nutrients too. So that you want more diversity, you gotta give the substrates to those bugs to grow and to feed. And the best way to achieve that is by giving them as a variety of, of things as possible. So a rich, diverse diet is, and, and of course, reducing in sugars and and I find I sugar to be reduced because that tends to. It is an interesting uh, uh, observation or a, a fact because we, we are now uh, uh, developing a, a new app. We are uh, basically recording what a user doing in a week. And we are seeing that uh, let's say average user, at least of instant tracker is consuming I know, between 20 to 50 different uh, food items, uh, 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 different food items mm -hmm. in a week. And if you think about it, we have like 8,000 or so different food items that are available for us. So we have a universe and like we that, do that. we are consuming something like that. And what you are saying, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, if you want to grow a, a, a pig, you need to feed the pig. And if you want to grow a, I don't know, a cow, you need Absolutely. to feed the cow. And they, they eat different food. So <laughs> the same for bacteria, exactly. it as, uh, as diverse as possible. That's, that's a very good observation. So, so yeah as rich as possible, as diverse as, and you made a point that I think is very interesting, which is this idea of, of foods, right? Of variability. And yet we're focusing on, on something very small, but even if you think more at the molecular level, even each of those foods is composed by a variety of nutrients. And if you, I think the FDA from those as knowledge about our guidelines for a hundred something, and there's if we consider the entire metabolic profile of all the things we could eat, right? It's uh, thousands of molecules. So, and those are the molecules that the microbes could be interested. So a little restricting ourselves in that, in that richness is to a large degree quite mind boggling uh, what we, we do to ourselves sometimes. <laughs> and what about eating for different health goals? If I wanted to prevent diabetes, should I aim for a microbiome that looks different than someone that's training for a marathon? Do we know enough about how these byproducts can impact 
kind of those long-term health so, goals yeah, or short-term it's, health it's goals? Very good point. There's some research suggesting that indeed certain foods can be associated with again the abundance of certain micros that seem to enhance physical activity. For example, I think there was a paper in in, in Nature Medicine on on that particular topic. So. I think the more we know about, of course, our goals and the composition of our microbiome, the more we can move towards, I won't call it personalized medicine, but personalized well-being, which is something we often, we neglect. We take, you know, we neglect even our own genetics in a way. So we're not even there in terms of understanding how complex are the scaffold on which these things work and the complexity of these things themselves, right? So it's really, uh, but I think we're, we're, again, with the cost of genet- of genomics going down, I think we're, we're definitely moving towards that level of analysis and the level of integration, again, with the development of AI and things like that. I think we're definitely doing very solid steps in, to, in, in order to be able to integrate these elements and associate it, as you said, and very well with the goal in life, right? Because we're not always aiming for the same things, right? So again, this tailoring needs to happen at one point, and I, but we're definitely doing good steps. To it. So um, we would like to uh, switch gear and discuss uh, metformin, which is actually uh, one of uh, my favorite uh, subject. And uh, we also uh, hosted uh, Nir Barzilai uh, a few episodes ago, and, I'm sure that you know him and you know that he's a big advocate of uh, metformin. Uh, but for our audience that haven't uh, listened to Nir uh, Barzilai or doesn't know what is metformin, we'd love to receive some background from you about metformin and the co- uh, connection to longevity and aging. So metformin is one of those molecules that has been around for a while. <laughs> that has been around for, uh, <laughs> you know, and it derives from a plant originally and it does a lot of good things doesn't do anything fantastically well, but it seems to be able to do a lot of positive, it has a lot of positive outcomes. So it's mostly known for type 2 diabetes treatment. It's one of the first line of treatment for type 2 diabetes, but it's also used for PCOS. It's been thought even as, as a potential treatment for cancer. And then people realized due to the positive effects and profiled how metformin was working in cells and kind of realized that the signature of metformin in cells was very similar to someone undergoing dietary restriction. So that kind of led a bit to this paradigm that maybe metformin could be this dietary restriction mimetic. And this led to work in several model organisms to which we contributed, where we could show that metformin could extend robustly actually longevity and health span in a variety of model organisms. It's been shown in C. elegans, it's been shown actually even in yeast and in flies. Um, and the work in mice and rats, there's a lot of work on this area. There's, there's a nice study from Rafael de Capo on it, where they could show how that reformer could also extend lifespan. But the work from, well, I, I'm, I'm not remembering the name, but it's a Russian scientist who, who did a lot of work on it. And it had mixed results. So it depended a lot on, on whether it was mice, rats, and gender, uh, sex also would really matter to seeing those positive effects of metformin on longevity. So another question, and this is why Nir Barzilai is doing with this trial in, in, in humans, it does a really interesting finding from a UKPDS study where metformin increased the survival of patients with type 2 diabetes, even more than matched controls that were healthy individuals. So these are people with a disease that are being treated and actually surviving for longer than healthy matched controls. So this then led, of course, to asking the question, what happens in healthy individuals that take metformin? And this is the million dollar question that everyone wants kind of answer, where if indeed could be a therapy that people could use, given its safety profile, it's definitely something to consider. There's many positive things. It's a cheap compound, easily accessible to a lot of people very good safety profile, except interaction with the microbiome, which people tend to overcome anyway. Yeah. And it's, it's just the question is whether it has any benefits in the healthy humans. That's the question. And, and I know that uh, Nir is running now a, a real clinical trials uh, with human and uh, he's uh, trying to answer this question and that's uh, 
as you said, it's a, let's say, a billion <laughs> dollar <laughs> equation. And, and, I, and I hope that we will have an answer for it soon. I think that it's like yeah. five years or something like that. So you don't expect it soon, but it's yes. soon enough, let's say. Um, so, so now I'm trying to connect between uh, the subject one that we discussed, probiotics and the uh, uh, microbiome and the uh, Metfor and then now subject to metformin. So any relationship between those uh, two? A lot, uh, actually. So we, again, if we go back to the small dose, my first question, I got into metformin and the microbiome a bit by chance. I, I was doing a postdoc and one of our aims was just to study polypharmacy, actually, at the time. So combining different drugs. And I started with metformin because... It was cheap. It was easy to do. You know, you got to start with something. <laughs> and I realized, and I think this was from my background, you know, I came to the C. elegans world a bit agnostic about um, the ecosystems that we were work, working with. And for me, having a compound and having two live organisms was always a bit confusing, even though people tended to assume from very early on that the bacteria there were just being a source of nutrients. But I needed to have the answer whether one was actually acting on the longevity of the host without any interaction with the microbes. Because for me, I had two live things there. And I made the discovery, this was already almost um, almost 15 years ago, a large proportion of the effects on C. elegans in terms of longevity and health were actually by the change in the microbial physiology induced by metformin on, on, on those bugs. And then work from there actually showed that mice that were on a high fat diet that take metformin, if you give them metformin, you see very clear changes and signatures in the microbiome of mice. And then work from Backage, Frederick Back and Pia Bork showed that this is actually in humans, it's a very striking signature. So to the point that uh, you'll find you can, you can tell who is on metformin by just looking at the microbiome, because there's a very clear signature change occurring in those. And then very nicely, if you transplant the microbiome from, from patients that have been taking metformin, this is where from Frederick Backhead, and you put it back into naive mice that have not, that are not taking metformin, those mice will have a better glucose homeostasis. And really shows that just this change in the communities in the microbiome is sufficient as a phenomena to, to harness benefits for a host which is, I think, a really, really striking finding. And then they discover also that one of the key, this was work from Peter Bork, one of the important members of the microbiome that could be eliciting was these effects were E. coli, so the famous Ishrishia coli. So, and this is where our work kind of intersects with that, where we can show that indeed E. coli has this signaling pathway that can understand signals both from metformin and nutrition to integrate and produce molecules of interest. So it's interesting that these findings even though it started in a small worm, it can be expanded and extended to to humans pretty much all the way. So, so in your opinion, uh, um, the microbiome is the major target of uh, metformin? I think it's, it's one, one of the targets. targets. This has been the big challenge for metformin, right? Uh, it has a many, many, many targets, right? And same here, I guess the microbiome is one important contribution. Then the relative contribution of the effect of the drug to, to, to humans will depend probably on the person's composition, both from its genetics and both from its microbiome. And it's really some, something interesting because the work from Stephen O'Reilly was showing that metformin effects were completely dependent on this GDF-15. And this has been replicated by another study. But now there's another new study showing that they don't see it. They don't see this effect. And now the question that everyone is asking, is it the microbiome that is actually, you see the effects of on GDF-15 because the microbiome is producing the molecules that elicit this sort of response, or and in, in other individuals with a different microbiome, you don't see it because indeed their microbiome is not responding. So again, there's so many layers of the complexity of how this compound works that it's fascinating, but also it doesn't make our lives any easy. <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, normally when you have a prescription, let's say like metformin for managing type two diabetes, you know, oftentimes, of course, we would love diet and exercise to be manipulated in order to also benefit whatever disease you're managing. But in the case of metformin, it sounds like nutrition and ex exercise can actually impact the effectiveness of that metformin as well. Yeah. So that's, Do we that's, see that in any other type of medication? 
<laughs> it's a good question. I'm trying to think about this. Whether in cells, I would say yes, right? If you think about, I don't want to say something wrong here, but we do know that some cancer drugs, the nutrition will have that effect. So fluoropyrimidines, the nutritional input that the cells receive dictates to a large degree how the drug functions. So that is known. And I think this, again, it's it's probably more prevalent than we know. It's just one of those things that we tend to, I think science ignored for a very long time, uh, is the contribution of nutrition to the function of certain drugs. And I think there was this very nice study from Louis Cantley in Nature a couple of years ago, maybe a bit more than that, where he did show that these PI3 kinase inhibitors that didn't work, you could actually make them work really well as anti-cancer therapies by changing diet. So again, I think it really is, we just haven't explored this topic deeply enough to understand how vast those sort of interactions actually occur. It's super interesting to hear it, you know, in the beneficial way. Usually all we hear about is contraindications. If you're taking this medicine, yeah. don't eat this life. Yeah, yeah. Which is a super interesting place for research to continue. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, just a side uh, uh, note about metformin. As much as I know, and Philip, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there are a side effect on the uh, exercise. So if you take metformin, the uh, uh, when you are exercising, you can uh, actually, uh, uh, let's say, delay the muscle build, uh, build up. That's correct. So I did, re and I remember reading about that. Yeah, it just goes to show that even though the two things independently are positive, right? The combination is not always the expected outcome, right? Yeah. And it's, I think it's it, we think about this a lot in, in, because I mentioned about polypharmacy before. And this concept that you can say, oh, I can play with the insulin signaling and I'll just now get the rep, the mTOR also, and I'll combine everything and I'm going to make these cells, you know, or I'll make these organisms live forever. And very often we don't find that. We find that actually things that we thought could act synergistically often happen to work antagonistically if you play with them. And this is all about energetic demands and resources. You can't play with major signaling pathways pull one up and without it having no con effects on the other. And I think, again, it's just we don't always fully understand or how these, the dependency of one pathway on another and therefore the simplistic approach to it is very likely to fail because we just, we just don't understand. So a more agnostic approach to these things is more likely to reap benefits. So rather than just saying, oh, we're going to play with pathway A, B and C because we know they are involved in aging, it's just say, well, we have pathway A that works really well. So metformin works really well because it does these things. What is there out there that could actually make metformin work better? And I think that could come through the through another compound or it could come through the effects through nutrition, clearly not exercise. <laughs> but this kind of illustrates that interaction map that you have things that will work really well, but there are other things we need to avoid. And then, but we kind of explore that space to find new things. And the simplest approach may not yield those results. Yeah, and then to wrap up the discussion about uh, metformin. So if we'll uh, fast forward, uh, let's say 10 or 20 years, and uh, let's, uh, let's hope that the uh, near Barzillai study will be positive. How do you see uh, metformin uh, uh, influence our life? Do you see all of us uh, consuming metformin like uh, statin? Or I think so. What will be the I, 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 I'll, I'll have an anecdote about that actually. Already, I definitely see that because the side effects are so little, right? The gain versus the balance between the gain of taking the drug versus side effects is just, if we can show that it has those benefits in terms of improving late life health, I think. I think it will be easy. But just to give you an idea already in terms of how many people are already taking metformin. So because of the rise of type 2 diabetes and obesity, et cetera. So there's so many people taking metformin in the world that you can find metformin in rivers. So you can actually de detect yeah. metformin in rivers in, 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 the, in, in China, in, in, in Germany, in, uh, in the UK and in the US. So it, it brings another problem here because metformin doesn't really get metabolized and we take grams of it today, right? So, and it all gets excreted through either feces or urine and it all ends up 
in rivers. So we'll have another thing to think about if we go into that direction that everyone will be taking much for it, it may create a, a additional unexpected issues. The next fluoridated water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly okay. that, yes. <laughs> All right, if we pivot back to physical activity a bit, obviously we've talked about, we just did with metformin, but are there, can we see changes in the microbiome from engaging in different types or intensities or amounts of physical activity? Yes. So yes, that's actually a, it's interesting you're asking that. There's research showing that indeed uh, this is happening and we are currently actually starting a study on on, on exercise and microbiome. So. In, in mice. So we're, we're going to look into that it, actually with the context of cachexia, so late life muscle decline. And this is something we're, we're interested in. And the idea is really to try to find metabolites really that could improve cachexia from the microbiome. So, so this is really something we're excited about. So there's definitely research and we're definitely, we're looking forward to contribute to this field. We'll keep an eye out for that. And sleep, I think, is another category, maybe even stress, too. Stress. That's getting so much due attention now. Do we know if either of those also modulate the microbiome? So sleep patterns definitely do. The circadian rhythm does. That's very well established now. And it has, and also people who have like night shifts and things that have a completely disrupted or unbalanced microbiome. Again, cause and consequence is, is sometimes hard to disentangle that, but there's definitely a consequence on. The, about the sleep, it's interesting because the sleep deprivation or sleep dysfunction in a way, the issues is that often you end up either taking medicine to it, which are likely to, especially uh, a lot of those medicines will impact on the microbiome. Or if you don't, you're likely to engage in certain behaviors like eating at different times during the night, or if you're awake, which again, will have, will alter your natural rhythm of your microbiome too. So there's those things that can be confounders. So it, whether just sleep per se, deprivation or bad sleep is enough to change the microbiome, I'm not sure there's much there. But because you change your behaviors because of sleep is being so important for our well-being, that all those changes, whether it's pharmacological or behavioral, will definitely have an impact on, on your microbiome, which of course then kind of has a negative feedback on the entire system. And uh, Philippe, another intervention that has a lot of hype today is the probiotic supplementation. And uh, if you look at the... Uh, look at the, the catalog of a lot of uh, supplement company you see so many of them and so different and the, this one have the 10 million then this one have 10 billion this one have this uh, bacteria this one have that bacteria and the question to you does it work at all and does it work the, <laughs> that the, the consumer uh, I think as a as a as a placebo, yes, it works. As a biological, I'm not convinced, <laughs> but I think we're not there yet. I think we need to continue to understand in very fine detail how these things contribute. And we for keep forgetting that it's not just what you're taking, it's also who's already there and what you feed them, right? So I think until we understand that level of complexity and all the elements that are necessary to harness those effects, I think we're, it's still very early days. I'm not saying they don't work for person A, B, or C, but it's more by chance than by design. And and I think this is okay. and no, yeah, and sorry. I think this is an, an an important point, right? Because we just it's you know if you have eight, one billion people taking probiotics, just by by random event, you will have potentially yeah. the right combination that can make it work, but. As I said, it's not by design. That's, that's a very good uh, advice for our uh, listener. And uh, uh, here at Insta Tracker, we love blood biomarkers, and uh, that's our focus. So the question, the next question is, uh, uh, is are there, can you name maybe the blood biomarkers that are related to uh, gut health and uh, uh, to gut bacteria? And what is the maybe the relationship between gut bacteria and the level of uh, blood biomarkers. Uh, I have to say, it's not my area of expertise in terms of blood biomarkers. I know it's a growing field. I know you 
you, what you do. And I know that's, there's a, but it's kind of, there is evidence though. There's work from Aaron Elanev and Aaron Gall that did look at different correlations between different microbes, the presence of different microbes and certain blood markers. What are the best predictors? I, I won't be able to say from the top of my head, but there are already established at least correlations. Um, in terms of causation, I'm not sure there is anything, at least that I'm fully aware. So a lot of these things, again, are statistical associations between abundance of something and of course, another parameter that has been measured. So, so again, I think the science needs to evolve. I think knowing due to the work that has been done by, by Steve and, 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 and I, and others on, on this field, it's important that, and also to now really understand what is leading to what and how can they disentangling basically the, uh, the causal roles, uh, of one thing to another, but, uh, as far as I can tell, especially in the context of aging, I don't think anything has been done. Yeah. And, uh, I have to say that, uh, a good scientist know to say when he doesn't know. So it's uh, it's good that you said it and I uh, really appreciate it. Okay. And when we talk about improving the microbiome, do you think about it as in increasing diversity or increasing the amount of specific types of bacteria? What does improving kind of mean yeah. when it relates to health? It's, it's, again, it's a tough one in a way. And I think you'll find defenders for both. I think the diversity has been shown to be very strongly correlated, at least with a, a healthy output. So in, in terms of the host function, so, so that has been very, the reduction of diversity is always associated with disease. So that is very, very nicely established, but of course we can't control that right very well. So therefore the alternative is of course, to try to identify now members that could have that positive effect. And there's been a lot of research, for example, on trying to enrich for acromantia, which has been shown to, to have multiple positive effects. So how can we do this? How can, what is the component of acromantia? And I think there was a paper in nature recently where they showed that there was some sort of a lipid from this bug that seems to have positive effects. So now the research understood that sure, there's the complexity is important, but we can't really achieve that. We can't sell it to the public easily in a way, if you want to put it this way. And so the easier way is probably by trying to identify a null micro that we can enrich in abundance or supplement whatever molecule, for example, that this micro could be producing and harness those positive effects. So is moving kind of the research further to kind of cut the steps of the complexity and moving on to something we can package it in a way a little bit simpler. I feel like the way that I have seen people increase their diversity the, mo the most is by getting food poisoning with something really nasty <laughs> that messes them up for a while. I've had a lot of people that have had those experiences recently. It's interesting to remember. There's also a bad part of introducing a lot more bacteria in there. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you, you never know with these things, how much it's going to disrupt the homeostatic state of your microbiome, well, you know, your microbiome lives in, an, in some sort of equilibrium and if sometimes introducing new things may not, may not work the way you expect them to. <laughs> Therefore you then have those reports where things go awfully wrong. <laughs> so, so yes. Awesome. And as a final kind of question that we ask for all of our guests is if you have a top tip that you would recommend for improving lifespan or health span um, as it relates to the microbiome or otherwise that you could share? Uh, the simple thing to say, and but probably the most right thing to say is just um, stay away from processed foods. That is just in terms of the composition of those foods and the impact direct on host cells and indirect through the microbiome is something really to stay away from as much as possible. I know in the current lifestyles that we have, it's not always easy and achievable, but try to balance if you have to try to balance that with really simple foods as much as possible and as diverse as possible. I strongly believe that diet is at the core of everything we, we do and is part of our it's probably one of the most important things for our well-being. 
A great tip to end on. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge today. I think this was our first microbiome one and it was incredibly interesting. So thank, thank you. you, Dr. Cabreo. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's been a pleasure to discuss science with both of you and for leading the questions in an excellent way. So and very interesting questions. Thank you. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more info, please go to www.insidetracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.